introduced this guy to the world and look at him now now he's a legend now everyone turns to him now he's on a podcast with uh, whoever and next thing i turn around he's endorsing arcos and Lee Stagner, you're a bit of a, you're, you're a legend in the industry. Welcome back to the show. How are you? Uh, well, thanks for having me, Mark. It's, it's uh, great to be back. Um, and yeah, you did start it all. You were the very first podcast I started listening to way back when. Um, not only Golf Pike, but first podcast of any type I started listening to years ago. So yes, it all started with you 100%. Well, I'm honored. And I didn't, this, this wasn't self-promotion. This was more just to say that I'm so happy so proud i'm i'm grateful that we could sort of introduce you a little bit and and it just shows that good information people want to lap this stuff up and and it's nice to have you back because i think the topic is just fascinating stuff that you've done and i've got all my notes here uh, for the, nice for the audio folks you can watch this on youtube as well but lou before we go there um tell us about you for the folks who didn't listen to the first podcast you were with us Sure. Um, so I've been working in analytics for a long time. I still have a job in corporate America. And uh, I started dabbling in golf analytics uh, several years ago. Uh, never had any intention of uh, doing anything with it beyond killing some time in the off season. And it took off in ways that I never intended or never imagined. And now I get to do some really neat stuff in the golf world. Um, I've worked with and worked with very elite players from professionals to elite amateurs, number of college players that I get to help out with, with strategy and analytics. Uh, I recently joined Arcos uh, and I'm part of the Arcos family now and I lead the data insights for them and helping them uh, with, uh, with all of the data that they have, which is, it's incredible. I mean, I now have access to a half a billion shots. They have a half a billion shots in their database and I get to uh, to play around with that and find insights on amateur players to help us all better. At the end of the day, that's what I really enjoy doing. And I know that's what you enjoy as well. So helping people to get better. And it, it's, uh, it's a fun, it's been a great ride. And it's, uh, it's still uh, awesome that I get to talk to people like you and, and do this uh, kind of for a semi living at the moment. I was about to say, so when is this becoming your day job? Because I know <laughs> you've got plenty of irons in your fire right now. Yeah, I'm pretty busy. I'm pretty uh, consumed with part-time golf work. And I, I think it's a good balance right now. Who knows, maybe someday it'll become full-time, but it's a, it's a great side job to have. And a job is definitely a very strong word. I wouldn't even call it a job to, to be able to combine the things that I love, golf and data. Uh, it doesn't even feel like working. Um, and so I, I, could, I could do this uh, full time for sure, but we'll kind of see how it plays out. I'm so glad you, glad you said that because I was speaking with someone earlier today and they were like, well, you know, you sound like you're so passionate about what you do. And I was like, look, let's be honest. I get to talk about a game I love and I get paid for it. I mean, yeah. stuff and, and, and along the lines of what you're doing here, um, the, the beauty of you is that you've taken your skill set and you are making data so easy to one understand and two apply. I think it's crucial. And, and, and a lot of the stuff we're going through, folks, I found on Lou's Twitter timeline. It's fascinating stuff. If you just go and search Lou Stagner, L-O-U-S-T-A-G-N-E-R. And I'm letting him share the screen here in case he can rustle up one of these stats once in a while and one of these numbers for the YouTube watchers here. Now, okay, Lou, um, first off, I want to ask you to tee this whole thing off, manage your expectations, because that was the hashtag that you started. And when I saw the first one, I was like, genius, because I cannot tell you how many lessons I've given. And I've said to the parent, well, this is what you can expect. And I'm sort of tempering them because we all have the delusions of grandeur and maybe uh, some of the opposite as well. What prompted you to go ahead and, and start a series of tweets like this, manage your expectations? Well, you know, I have to give credit to uh, Scott Fawcett there. So uh, I was affiliated with Scott and, and Scott created the decade system mm -hmm. and decade is an acronym. And, and one of the letters in there is E for expectations. And so that's something that he's been talking about, you know, for a while with um, his players um, and the people that use decade. And uh, what I wanted to start doing with that was 
really give context to players because I think our expectations as amateur players um, get so warped by what we see on TV. Like we are watching the best players in the world uh, playing their best on TV. And, and we see that and it's, it's um, I, and I don't understand why this is in golf, but for some reason in golf, weekend warriors like me feel like we should be able to play the game like the best in the world, which I would never dream I could play basketball like LeBron, like, or throw a football like Patrick Mahomes. Like I would never think that, but for some reason I feel like, ah, you know, I can, I can play golf at a pretty high level, which is very far from the truth. So I wanted to start giving really good context to people because I think what happens is golfers have an expectation around some part of the game. So let's say wedge play. It's always a very common topic. And you'll see a mid handicap or even a lower single digit handicap player, you know, hit a wedge from 100 yards and they will feel like they've hit a poor wedge shot and they'll beat themselves up over it. And when the reality was they didn't, you know, they maybe hit it to 25 feet. That's a great shot Mm -hmm. um, for really almost any level of player. And they beat themselves up over it. And the, the, the expectation that they have um, is unrealistic. They start to feel bad about their wedge game. And ironically, that expectation can sometimes end up actually impacting their wedge game, like in a negative way, where if they really truly understood what was appropriate for their skill level, they wouldn't cause themselves unneeded problems with their game. Hopefully that makes sense. It makes so much sense. I cannot tell you and anyone who's listened to the show for any extended period of time, no, I come at this from a really holistic viewpoint. And I, 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 beyond my count, how many golfers have talked themselves from a decent place into a golfing grave because right. of what they thought they should be doing. I, I want to read, you, you retweeted this, and then there was another one I want to touch real fast too. And this was recent. This was from last week in Japan, and the PGA Tour put this out, and you tagged it with, Marikawa is a pretty good iron player, arguably yeah. the best on the planet. Right. It's one off the hosel. We're all capable of ugly shots, even the best one in the world. Ugly shots, I should say. And Marikawa's quote was, well, I did something in my career that I haven't done yet. Shank a shot. So you quickly said to the folks, look, these guys aren't perfect. In fact, you shared an anecdote uh, with a good player that you, that you work with who won an event and he said he had a few snap hooks. He topped a three wood, I think. Right. And you shared the whole thing to say, look, golf is this beautiful culmination of nastiness. And if you just stay in it, you can pretty well do well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I put something out around shanking, which I hate to hate to say that word because yeah, it all sure. gives us the shivers, really? uh, but something around John Rahm, like you can go, go and Google John Rahm shank and go to YouTube and you'll find a number of videos of Rahm hitting it off the hosel. And I tweeted something out similar to what I did about Morikawa, where I, I said, you know, and I had pictures of all of the times that Rom hit it off the hosel and you, you can see the shot tracer on there. It's just, you know, 45 degrees, right. And the message of the tweet was, you know, John Rom, number one player in the world, he's hit more than one shot off the hosel. And, you know, you, you are probably not as good as John Rom. Like you're going to hit some bad shots and it's okay. Um, if, if John Rom was impacted by hitting it off the hosel, he wouldn't have made it to number one in the world. Right. We all hit bad shots. We have to get past those and focus on the next one and give it everything we have and try to get the best outcome we have on every shot. And if we dwell on everything negative that happens, you know, we're not going to get to number one in the world in John Rahm's case, or, you know, we're not going to, you know, fire a personal best at some point. So hashtag manage your expectations. Um, I want to keep it right here with a wedge game because there was something in folks who have not seen this. Um, the graphics that Lou puts together are so easy to understand and they make so much sense and they, they, they really tell a story, but I'm going to let you embellish on this one. Um, wedge play, you know, keeping it in the, the shank thing on the PGA tour. This is from your data from 80 yards in the fairway. 21% of the shots finish outside of 25 feet. 
Yeah, I mean that's it's incredible to to say that. Um, Build on that fire, please. Yeah, uh, you know it's one of those where when I when I put things like that out there, you would be surprised at the number of um, I'm not going to call it hate mail, but the number of direct messages I get from people <laughs> saying that that's completely false. You're making this number up. That's not realistic, and and that is realistic. And you know, do I think that sometimes on the PGA Tour where they cut the hole generally relatively close to the edge. You know, most pins on tour are six yards or less from the edge most of the time. And, and sometimes our, our players playing away from that. Uh, yes, I 100%. Um, but that in and of itself should, we should maybe learn something from that. Like if they're so good and they're the best in the world, why are they picking targets away from challenging flags? Um, and we can, we can learn just from that concept in and of itself but yeah from 80 yards in the fairway it, it's amazing to think how many they hit outside of 25 feet um and me uh, i have a, a 4.6 index now i think is what my index is um if i hit something to 25 feet from 80 yards i'm pretty excited i'm pretty happy i, I just hit a pretty decent shot for my skill level and it's one thing that I try to do with uh, the players that, uh, you know, I'm trying to influence or help online. And then the, my friends that I play with is help them manage their expectations. And I think that's such an important part of the game. And so is that is a tour level stat directly relatable to a 10 handicap? Maybe not, but it puts things in really good perspective and it helps give people really good context about expectations and maybe identify expectations that are unrealistic for them. Attention, all of the college golfers listening to watching this again, it's available on YouTube. I've seen so many collegians, young amateurs just absolutely lose their minds after right. a wedge from the fairway to like 20 feet. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys have got no idea. Yeah. On a recent podcast, I'd love you to build on this. We had John Wood, you know, former caddy, now announcer with NBC. Sure. And Tim, I'm like, you know, what? I like your caddies. I'm like, you guys are eternally optimistic because they've always got good news for their player, right? And then I'm like, just about every shot you guys are over, no matter what the club is, you like aim it at the TV tower, which is right over the middle of the green. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we're, yeah. you're right. Because you go and attack a stupid flag, even with a wedge, you short side yourself. All of a sudden, you, the, the chance of bogey is ev evaporated, and, all, and largely bogey comes into play. And, and, and you made an observation here. Check this one out, folks. On the tour, the average birdies per round is 3.6. So average on tour is three and a half birdies around. Yeah. That puts stuff into context for the listeners, too, to go, well, dang, I only made two birdies today, but that's not so bad. No, it's, it's not bad at all. I think that's one thing that um, players are chasing too much is trying to make more birdies. That is not the key to lower scores. And take a tour player. So they're averaging just over three and a half birdies per round, 3.6 per round. And if you look at a 20 handicap player, they are averaging 0 0.3 birdies per round. So right. a tour player makes 3.3 more birdies per round compared to a 20 handicap. Now there's legitimately 30 or so shots of difference between a tour player and a 20 handicap. If you put them on the same track mm -hmm. and of those 30 shots, only three of them are because the tour player made more birdies. Um, so the, the key for us amateur players is not making more birdies. The key is making less bogeys, less doubles, less others. That means initially starting with first and foremost, keep the ball in play, right? Yeah. Do I want you to hit fairways? Yes. Do I want you to hit it long? Yes. But we have to eliminate penalty strokes from the equation that kills the scorecard. And then after that, it becomes about limiting how much you short side it and also limiting big mistakes in other parts of the game. Again, really mostly related to penalty strokes. Uh, but the key to scoring better and dropping your handicap is not going to be through more birdies. Um, you will see a fractional uptick in your scoring by making more birdies. You are going to see a huge improvement in your handicap by reducing your others and your doubles and your bogeys that's how we get better and it's it golf is a boring game 
And uh, do we all want to go out and make six or seven birdies in a round? Yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't happen too often. And that's not how you're going to uh, really drop strokes off your handicap. I shared this before and I'll do it again quickly. And then I want to touch that double bogey number because you've got a statistic for that too. Um, I heard this many, many moons ago where the guy goes, surefire way to shoot 78. He goes, hit six greens in regulation, only six. Two putt those. He said, then the next six greens you hit, chip and putt those. So one pitch, one putt. Then the other six, you can miss. Again, you're missing 12 greens. On those, you chip and two putt. You add those up and it's 78. And yeah. he said this to me. I was like, you know, that's really simple sounding. But it's amazing how, I guess, people try to force the issue a little to your birdie count. Then they take on targets that aren't necessarily. Their expectations are clearly blurred because now they're just losing their minds they're panicking and all of a sudden what should be a decent day kind of turns just rabid yeah absolutely and you know um short sighting yourself is is very problematic and so people are oftentimes getting too aggressive they're aiming at too many flags they're trying to get it close to make more birdies and when you have your target closer to the flag uh which in some situations it's going to be closer to one side of the green than the other. We don't play too many holes, even at the amateur level where the hole is dead center in the green. It's always shifted one side or another. And when you short side it more, it becomes much more difficult to get it up and down a 20 yard shot. When you have four yards of green to work with is significantly more difficult than a 20 yard shot. When you have 18 yards of green to work with as golfers, we all understand that we all know that. And so limiting how often we put ourselves in those really challenging situations is how we start to lower our score. It's going to give you a better opportunity to get up and down as opposed to knocking it on um, and two putting for a bogey or in, in the case of many amateurs, the dreaded double chip where mm. they get short sided and they don't even make it to the green and they have to chip again and they two putt. And now they walk off with a double. So those are the things we're trying to avoid to help the game. Oh, you know what? That is, so, I, I want to touch this because I want to get to the double bogey number. Um, but so many folks, they're a little short-sighted. They've got that shot that's sort of 50-50. The, I'm going for the super floppadopolis kind of thing. <laughs> Slide underneath it, the ball doesn't go anywhere. And then all of a sudden, just instead of putting the ball on the green, putting the worst case scenario of a bogey on your scorecard, then that thing starts to multiply, really. It's what yeah, it, it, it does. Whips. Even for tour pros, Mark, even for tour pros, it's significantly more challenging to, to, to short side it. And it's as much as about a third of a shot. So the example I just gave you, if a, if a tour pro was really short sided, so I'll say really short sided as 20 yards from the hole with five yards of green to work with that compared to 20 yards of green and 18 yards of green to work with. If you were to put tour pros in both locations and let them all hit hundred shots each, the average score when they're long sided is going to be about a third of a shot lower, which that's a significant number. So if you short side it four or five times throughout the course of a round, that's easily a shot and a half to two shots for a tour pro for higher handicaps. It's even more. And, and so that is uh, it, definitely something I work with uh, with all the players at every level that I, that I uh, get to work with is around short siding it and not being too aggressive. We don't want to be too conservative, but we also don't want to be too aggressive. Aim at the aim at the television tower. Hey, <laughs> Simpson on this very show said to me, he goes, I've got no problem with a bogey. He goes, I will make mistakes, but what I will not do and what I don't want to do is turn one mistake into two shots. And that's like one of his mantras. He goes, I'll, I'll make bogeys. I can recover from those. Right. Now, speaking of the two, you had a graphic that was so telling. Um, average double bogeys per round. And the 20 handicapper averaged about six and a half. Right. The 10 handicapper averaged about three. Yep. The scratch was 0.7 and the tour player was 0.3. Now. Yeah. I, I want to I want to camp out on two areas. First, the good golfers. The difference there between the scratch player and the tour player is not that great. So I, I want you to delve in there with with your sort of an analytical mind and tell me what you what you think there between the scratch and the tour player. 
Um, you know, scratching a tour player, there's there's probably, you know, if we're being real, realistic, maybe six to eight shots difference between them. Um, and that would be for a, a well-tested scratch player. You know, a, a scratch player, a club scratch player that's not playing a lot of tournament golf, um, they may have a scratch handicap, but, you know, give me a tournament-tested scratch player with a, a tournament scratch handicap. And that player is going to be between six and eight shots worse than a tour player and maybe more depending on the situation. But, you know, the difference between 0.3 and 0.7 is, is just um, I, I wish I could tell you exactly why that is. And if, if I had to guess, uh, scratch players are going to make more penalty strokes. Scratch players are going to hit more bad shots because they don't make solid contact as much as a tour player. So there's probably a lot of contributing factors to that. But when you go down the scale a little bit and you start to look at the worst um, skilled golfers, lower skilled golfers, and you get down into the 20 and 15 handicap range where 20s are making six and a half doubles per round or double or worse per round, that's all driven by hitting it, you know, hitting it off the farm. They are putting it out of play. They're reloading. They're hitting three from the tee. Hitting three from the tee, I don't care what you're if you're a tour player or you're a 20 handicap hitting three from the tee is bad for your scorecard mm -hmm. it's not a good situation and so they are driven by hitting far too many balls out of play and, and having far too many big huge blow-ups because of things like penalty strokes and double chipping um and uh, those are the huge culprits to uh, to putting doubles and worse on the card but along your observation from earlier the 20 handicapper if they just keep the ball in front of them and they eliminate three doubles, you just turn those into um, bogeys. Right. All of a sudden you're scoring in the mid eighties ish, mid to high. Right. And then your confidence percolates a little bit. And then all of a sudden that becomes the low eighties. And then for that 10 handicap golfer, because I'm sure you've seen hundreds that now want to shoot in the seventies, the key to that is trying to take those doubles and turning just those into bogeys and perhaps the odd par. And there you have the differential, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm, you will not find a bigger proponent for hitting the ball as far as you can. Distance is extremely important. Uh, one of the players I've been recently working with his index ranges between an 11 and a 15. And I, the way that I work with players on strategy is uh, we start with driver. And we need a really good reason to not hit driver. Well, he has lots of good reasons to not hit driver because his dispersion is so big with his driver. It's something he's working with on his coach. So even though I am a huge advocate for hitting driver as often as you can, as far as you can, in his case, we had to scale that back because he was just way too wild with his driver. Mm -hmm. And he was racking up far too many, many penalty strokes. So a player like, like him needed over 85 yards of room between penalty strokes situations to feel comfortable hitting the driver. He didn't always have that on the course he was playing. So he would step up on a hole and let's say there's 80 yards in between OB on the right and water on the left. That's not enough room for him. He's going to hit the ball out of bounds too high a percent of the time to um, optimize his scoring. So for him, even though driver is the, is the play for a large chunk of players, for him, it's not because he's hitting the ball too much OB. So all of the things we talk about here, um, they do somewhat apply generically, the concepts do, but each player can be a little bit different depending on their skill level. So depending on your skill level, understanding how big of a window you need for your different clubs is really important because that is going to drive you to help make better decisions strategy wise. It will also drive you to work with your swing coach on the things that you really need to work on. And this particular player, he really needs to work on his driver. So he's hopefully tackling that soon and we can start to get that back in play for him. I want to talk about the driver dispersion and the misunderstandings that you've now proved with all of your data research. But before I go there, a couple more numbers, just quickly to put a bow on this conversation, just about scoring. Um, you did the research and said since 2011 on the tour, two or less birdies were made 30% of the time. That yeah, was so those that I had to go, come on. 
Really? Yeah, it's uh, pretty surprising to to 30% of the rounds played have, have two or less birdies on the PGA Tour. Now, if I'm being if I'm being perfectly honest there, that didn't include Eagles, but Eagles don't get made too often. So if I kind of mix those into the equation, there are some occasions where a player will have one birdie and one eagle in a round. I think the number dropped down to 27%, maybe 27 and a half percent. But still, that's a very large chunk of rounds where they don't make a lot of birdies. And the key to scoring well um, is limiting bogeys. Um, and even I peeled back the, the, the onion on this. I had someone reach out and say, well, um, it must mostly be players that are missing the cut that are having rounds like this. And that wasn't the case. Um, a, I, I think it was about almost 40% of these rounds came from players that made the cut. Um, and that was only looking in round one and round two. Uh, when you look at all rounds, I think 56 or 57% came from players that made the cut. So limiting your big numbers is what players on tour are really good at doing. Like they only make 0.3 doubles or worse per round. They're really good at limiting their numbers. So when they have an off day, they maybe only put one or two birdies on the board but they're only putting a couple of bogeys on the board and maybe they scratch out a 73 or 74 that day doesn't necessarily put them at the top of the leaderboard, but they also didn't put an 83 on the board. Like they're still there. They can come back and with a decent round and, and get through to the weekend, for example. So it, it's a, it's really eye opening when you look at that. And now that I'm part of Arcos, one of the things I'll be doing is that kind of analysis for every level of game. I can't wait to see what it, that looks like for scratch players. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be, um, if tour players are 30%, I think scratch players are going to be a whole lot less. <laughs> or, sorry, a whole, sorry, a whole lot more, a whole yeah. lot more. No, I, yeah, I could certainly see that going on because again, like I can't tell you how many golfers will come for a lesson and I'll be like, okay, what's the problem? Get to know you time. And they'll be like, well, I can carry it. 300 yards off the tee i'm like no you can't <laughs> <laughs> i've got this behind my eyes okay because folks just they don't have the right expectations for their game and you talk about those scratch players this one was always curious this was also curious to me and i'd love you to build on this because i'm a big one for making threes on par threes and fours on par fives and then you have the nucleus for a very good round if you did that right. You four under par for nearly half of the holes you play. So you've got to cobble together something just halfway decent over the final 10, and you'll be shooting around par or better. Now, I know you're not going to birdie every par five. That's proven. But you, you did this. I don't know if this is from Arcos or not, but you were talking about scratch amateurs average 4.95, so nearly five, on a 495-yard hole. Right. Which I found fascinating because... I would think most, because the 495 hole, that's kind of like the long par four, right? It's sure. an incredible par five. Every scratch handicapper or decent golfer gets in the tee going, I'm going to make birdie. Right. When you showed me that they're basically making five, uh, the, this this was very interesting to me, and I'd like you to, 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 to embellish if you can. Yeah, those those numbers for scratch amateurs are are pretty amazing so scratch amateurs are very good players they are in the you know upper one and a half percent of of golfers that play the game so they are in pretty elite company and you're right uh, they average 4.95 on a hole that's 495 yards long so uh there's so many situations where a scratch player will get up on a shorter par five which 495 for a scratch player would be on the short side and they are licking their chops thinking this is a must make birdie situation when the reality is, you know, par is a pretty good score there. Like you, they're not going to birdie that hole too often and making a five on that hole is really not going to give much away to the field if they are playing in an event with other scratch amateurs. And when you look at some of the other numbers, a scratch amateur from the fairway is going to, to average three shots to get up and down from 92 yards. So put scratch amateurs in the fairway at 92 yards. It takes them three shots on the average to get the ball in the hole. 
To put that in context, a tour player averages three from 168 yards. So you can see there's a huge gap between tour players and scratch players, but 92 yards for a scratch amateur from the fairway, which when you share that kind of information, people, you know, they don't believe it. And that's one of the things that I think is um, really useful for players is to understand you know, what typically it takes to hole out from different, different locations. Because when you are a hundred yards and you hit it to 25 feet and you two putt, you just did really well. You did better than what a typical scratch player would do in that situation. And so understanding that I think can, you know, help keep you in a really positive and good frame of mind when you're out there and not go to, I think you called it earlier, you know, the graveyard of your game. Like, you know, stay, we want to stay out of that. And we can do that by understanding what's good and what's bad. And for the handicapped golfers listening, just sort of proliferate this into what your skill level is, because obviously the numbers would, would go up. And it reminds me, Lou, of, you know, a national championship back when I was a college coach. We were playing in West Virginia and they had modified this golf course past 72 down to a past 70. So they were two pretty beefy uh, par fours that were par fives for the members. And I stood on the tee with my team of five. And the, f- the second hole was the first one. It was like a 489 yard hole. Um, and it was a par five for the members. And it said par four on the scorecard. And every single one of them, as they looked at, at a four, they were like, wow, this hole is impossible. Tiny green sloping, narrow fairways. And I'm like, well, what if this was a short par five? You'd be on this tee thinking, well, this is a birdie hole, right? And just that mindset because then they played it as a par five. Because I'm like, people are likely going to make five on this hole. If you just knock off the odd birdie or the four, you gaining strokes. Lo and behold, it did. They nearly won that week just by modifying their their mindset on the tee on on the difficult holes. Yeah, that that is. Um, there there was a study done around that a, a while ago, but how our mindset changes based on standing on the tee and and the scorecard tells you it's a par four or par five. And uh, it's interesting how that impacts what we feel and how we feel. We stand up on a 490 yard hole as a, as a scratch player and think, you know, I'm going to put, I'm going to be disappointed if I don't put four on the card. And if we put a, you know, par four on the scorecard, we stand on that same hole and we think, uh, you know, this is going to be the hardest part, you know, hardest four I'm going to have to make all day. Um, it's interesting how it changes, how we approach that and think about that. And I think understanding what is good and what's realistic and, and what the field is going to do if you're if you're a competitive player, I think can help you, you know, manage your game a lot better. Like there's a college, I have it up right now on the screen. Um, there's a college event going on right now that I'm, I'm following for uh, one of the players that uh, that I that I work with. And there's a really challenging par three in this in this event. And the uh, current scoring average there is 3.3. Um, and, you know, we knew going into it that, you know, over three rounds playing this 3-3-4 three, three, was probably going to break even on the field. So if you happen to make a bogey in one of the rounds, it's, it's not the end of the world because it's going to be a really challenging hole. Um, and I think understanding and knowing that can, uh, you know, help you manage your game a lot better uh, as opposed to thinking you can't make any mistakes. There's, you're going to make so many mistakes. You brought up one of the other college players that I work with who won an event and he said, I, I hit so many bad shots. Like if you saw me and you saw a highlight reel of my worst shots, you would wonder, you know, how I finished the event. I think he was at 12 under over three rounds on a tough golf course, you know, how I finished an event at 12 under when I, you know, stone cold topped a three wood that went like 40 yards um, and other shots that he hit that were just really poor. Um, So it's uh, it, that's going to happen and expecting perfection at any level is I think about one of the worst things we can do for our game. Truly is. Okay. Talking about um, perfect segue. I want to talk about a few strokes gained numbers of interest from the tour. But before we go there, you'll hear folks like myself with a microphone in front of my face talking about how so-and-so is trying to eliminate one side of the golf course. Yes. Dustin Johnson for argument six, which they are. And then they hit a few balls in one round and they don't hit any, any left. And we're like, the swing work is working out. Driver makeup is working fine. But you showed an interesting graphic and you charted all of the tee shots. 
Right. Even the golf is at the very top of the game. They're missing left and right of dispersion on, I think it was a launch monitor data, pretty regularly. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. I understand what people uh, are saying um, when, they, when they say those kind of things. But when you look at the data and like look at actual on-course data for somebody like DJ who hits pretty much exclusively a cut, like the only time he's going to hit a draw off the tee is when there's trees in the way on the left and he has no choice. Um, and he's probably not going to hit a driver in that situation. He might, you know, put a three wood a little back in his stance and hit a three wood around the corner. Um, but when you look at actual performance, um, if somebody was eliminating one side of the golf course, um, I wouldn't think of it just what percent missed left and what percent missed right. I would look at it from, let's look at your bad shots. Let, let's look at your shots that lose you know, a quarter of a stroke or more or three quarters of a stroke or more. And if you're truly eliminating one side of the golf course, we wouldn't see you have bad shots to, in DJ's case, on the left side. We would only see bad shots on the right side, but that's not the case. We see them pretty equally. And when you look at the best drivers of the golf ball, they have a pretty equal miss to one side or the other. And the worse you are off the tee, the more you skew to one side. And if you think of it from, forget about shape for a second, forget about the notion of eliminating one side, every player has a center of their shot pattern and every player has a shot pattern that's a certain size. And if we are aiming our, the center of our shot pattern appropriately, we're going to be able to put that over a place that's going to optimize our scoring, which means, you know, when you're out, you're going to miss some left, you're going to miss some right. You're never going to be able to miss everything to the right. You're going to have a center of your shot pattern, wherever that is, and you need to aim that appropriately. So kind of the takeaway here is on the PGA tour, the better drivers, they're missing things equally on both sides. The worse you are off the tee, the more you're likely to be missing to one side. And there's a number of other, um, you know, stats people out there like Richie Hunt. I'm sure you know Richie. You know, Richie has done uh, some work around that as well. And, you know, everything that, that he's put out, you know, aligns with that exactly where the better players, they have a more balanced miss, which is what, you know, I try to get with uh, the players I work with is a balanced miss. Yeah, I'm glad you said so too, because with a good player, let's say they're trying to hit that power fade, that thing's lined up down to the left center and a good fade shot will be pulled if you miss right. with the face of it. Same thing with a draw guy. You'll see Rory McIlroy every so often just block one off to the right hand side. It's just when you hit that outlying stuff that, that, that you get yourself into a little bit of a uh, problem. Okay. Uh, strokes gain numbers. You know, you've talked about managing your expectations. I've kept you, kept you for a long time already, but I want to go here because game, the golf game to me is a game of recovery. And I want you to talk about this first off. This is off the tour. PGA tour players miss 50% of their putts from eight feet. That's yeah. Talk about that just to help folks listening kind of put their putting into perspective. Yeah, they do. They, they miss 50% from eight feet, which is, um, you know, when you, when you share that number with people, it, it seems hard to believe. And, and I think sometimes we, um, we base tour performance on what we see on TV okay. and players on TV are generally playing pretty well. They're making putts um, that, that we don't see the entire field. Uh, and oftentimes when we see a highlight from somebody that isn't in contention, we're seeing a putt that somebody hold out. Yeah. Uh, so we have these kind of warped expectations of what tour players are really doing. If we saw every shot from the entire field, you, you as somebody that covers the tour, you get to see it all when you're walking with a group, you're covering a group. You, I'm sure you see some doozies where you're like, Ooh, that was, <laughs> that was an interesting shot. We don't generally get to see that with the best players on Saturday and Sunday, because they're just playing really well. But yeah, eight feet uh, is about the 50% mark. And a tour player from five feet is only you know 76% from five feet. Uh, they're not guaranteed. They're not automatic. Um, and so us amateur players, when we get in that four foot, five foot, six foot range, I know we want to make as many of those as we can. But even the best players in the world 
are not making every putt from four to six feet, uh, not even close. Um, at six feet, there it drops down to 65%. So in the PGA Tour, from three feet to 10 feet, every inch you get farther away from the hole, percentage make rate drops by, you know, almost a percent in some situations, half percent in others, it's maybe about three quarters of a percent. Um, at three feet, they make 96%. At 10 feet, they make about 38%. So it kind of falls off pretty quickly as they get farther away from the hole. And knowing that and understanding that can help you not get upset when you miss a six footer. Do you want to make it? Absolutely. Are you going to miss a bunch of them? You will. Um, tour players do. So it's, it's good to understand that and know that. Here's my take. Don't three putt that stuff in the interest. <laughs> in the back right. I mean, I know that sounds kind of asinine, but it's true. And, yep. and the reality is because you did an awesome graphic because I've had knockdown drag outs with colleagues of mine on the first cut podcast where they will say, well, the winner is going to come from the guy who's leading strokes gained off the tee. I'm like, nah, the guy who's taken that stuff and then turning it into low scores by getting good around the greens is likely the individual who's going to win. And you did. Uh, I think it was the graphic. If I get this correct, you correct me. Incorrect. You said strokes gain around the green on the PGA Tour by finish position. Right. Typically, the better guys were making saves around the greens, or if they were hit one to 50 feet, they were two putting. Or if they were off the green, they were the one making the saves. And the better you save around the greens, the better your score is going to be. Yeah, and it's interesting. So the way that strokes gained works is you can gain or lose shots on every uh, shot that you take. And uh, around the green is when you when you miss the green or if you get really close on a drivable par four or your second shot on a par five and you're just off the green, those would go into the around the green bucket. Players that are near the top of the leaderboard, they generally hit a lot of greens, right? They're generally doing well and they're not missing a lot of greens. Mm -hmm. So they have less chances to earn strokes around the green. Um, less total strokes around the green. So if I play, and, and let's just make this an easy example. If I hit 17 greens and I only miss one green, I only have one chance to earn strokes around the green. It's hard to earn a lot of strokes around the green when I only have one chance to do it. Let's say an, another player has an off day with the irons and, and they miss 10 greens. They now have 10 opportunities to earn strokes around the green. They also have 10 opportunities to lose, but they have 10 opportunities to gain. And looking at the strokes gain total for around the green is useful, but it's a little bit better when you look at it on a per shot basis, which is what I did there. Like how many strokes are you gaining or losing per shot? And that removes the um, you know sometimes confusing variable of how many chances did you have? And how many chances did, did you have is really related to how many greens did you miss? So when, when uh, top finishers, players that are winning, they may not miss a lot of greens, but when they do, they are playing better than the rest of the field. Mm. They are earning, they are gaining more strokes on a per shot basis than anybody else. So winners are not doing it with just approach play, just off the tee, just Putting, they're doing it with every category. So when you look at every single category, off the tee, approach, around the green, and putting, winners as a group are better than everyone else. They're playing better than everybody else across all those categories, which is why they won. Now, do some categories have a lot of, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, information as to how well you're going to do with long term? Yeah, I mean, being a good approach player on the on the PGA Tour is a pretty good thing. Being a good player with your driver is a pretty good thing. Uh, but if you want to win, you need to do well in all categories, generally. And that is Lou telling you folks, when you go and practice, go and touch every department of your game. I'm going to- For sure. Because, yeah, I'll leave you with this one. PGA Tour players miss the green from 140 yards in the rough. One out of two times, yes, 50% folks. You can find more of this cool information from Lou at his Twitter site. Do, do share the handle for us, please. Yeah, at Lou Stagner on Twitter. Uh, so feel free to, to follow me and send me some messages. would love to hear from everybody. Uh, is there any other website or anything they can find from you? Uh, you find me at Arcos Golf as well, too. Uh, so you can you can find me there. And I'm part of Arcos now and super excited to uh, to be taking all that data and continuing to manage expectations with uh, half a billion shots of amateur data now that I get to analyze.
manage your expectations. Great work, Lou, as always. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me again, Mark. Really enjoy it.